I was in Liverpool, the kind of clubs I went to were down a dank flight of stairs, and you had to sign in under a false name. I was usually George Orwell or Lulu. But once Liverpool merchants had done their commerce and made all their money, they then wanted to have somewhere to go to enjoy it. And in 1797, the great, the good and the beardy and the very wealthy set up their own club. And they called it the Athenaeum. One of the current members of the Athenaeum is a property developer with a social conscience. Lawrence Westgaff is a modern merchant prince of the city. Basically, every member is, a is known as a proprietor, which means you have a, a share in, in, the, in the club. And this book um, just names all the shareholders and when they, when they became shareholders. And it goes back to, uh, right back to 1797 when the club, club was originally founded. Right. Um, and I own the share of uh, a Mr. Thomas Tarleton, which is share 370. He was the original proprietor and I was elected in March 2007. Yes. And funnily enough, he was a, a notable Liverpool slave trader from a, a, long, fam a long line of slave traders is going back to his, his uh, grandfather. The ironies of, uh, of uh, who, who you know, ha had your original share are uh, immense, aren't they, really? I mean, uh, I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, I think he was probably turning in his grave. <laughs> 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 who knows? So even back in the 18th century, because of its kind of boomtown nature, did Liverpool have a kind of image problem in that way? Well, it was not seen as a sophisticated city. It was seen as a place where you went to make money. We, we had a town which was based on making money, and then the philanthropic institutions that come off the back of that were to make life more pleasant while we went about acquiring this wealth in yeah. whatever means we we yeah. saw fit yeah. so that's why you have organizations like the the, the Athena or establishments like right. the Athenaeum being set up that's why you had the Lyceum Club which opened in 1802 on Bold Street on Church Street proper we had uh, the Liverpool dispensary for the sick which were, again was found was founded by men who founded the Athenaeum in order to provide medicines for the poor all these organisations were established to make life better, not necessarily for, for the poor people of society, but certainly for the people who were, who were creating the wealth and, and, and then uh, endowing these institutions with that wealth. The interesting fact is that many of the merchants who established the organisations, even though they were involved in these great philanthropic acts, their money had been made through the exploitation of people, and I often wonder, how did they rationalise that, or did they even bother to try and rationalise that in their minds? Whatever the private state of the merchants' minds was, it's perhaps not a surprise that when the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade was formed in 1787, the Liverpool branch only had two members. One of these was William Roscoe. He was a notable exception in the city, a merchant and an abolitionist. This didn't make him popular. A fellow merchant denounced him as a busybody, a meddler, as a mischief monger whose wish and object were to destroy the town and trade of Liverpool. At the turn of the 19th century, many figures in the establishment were much more rounded individuals than they are today. William Roscoe was both a businessman, a merchant and a banker, but he was also a writer and a poet. And his poetry is certainly something that I think Alan Sugar could have composed today. This one is called Ode on the Institution of a Society in Liverpool. From climes where slavery's iron chain has bound to earth the soaring mind, where Grecia mourns her blasted plain to wanton indolence resigned, from fair Italia's once loved shore, that land of freedom, now no more. Disdainful of each former seat, the arts, a lovely train, retreat. Luckily, Roscoe's powers of persuasion were much greater than his powers of composing poetry. And gradually, he began to convince the formerly profit-driven and careless merchants of Liverpool that a little bit of culture could be good for them and good for business. 
Roscoe's timing was good. In 1807, the slave trade was abolished, and Liverpool had to face up to this new reality. The slave merchants of the city realized that in order to survive in this new world, they had to distance themselves from the past and change the image of Liverpool. Roscoe's vision for Liverpool seemed to offer the solution. No longer would it be a grubby slaving port, but a place of civilization and culture. Liverpool soon swapped the lucrative slave trade for an equally lucrative trade in cotton. And fueled by this money, the city fathers helped to pay for botanic gardens, art galleries and reading rooms designed to make Liverpool the Florence of the North. This is St George's Hall. Before its construction, every large building in Liverpool had been of a commercial nature. But now, the city's mercantile class wanted to show that they were cultured, sophisticated, knew which end of a fish knife to use. And so they had this built. But they hadn't left their capitalist bombast that far behind. Because really, they didn't care what it looked like, as long as it was really, 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 really big. So the final design drawings were superimposed on Westminster Hall, St. Paul's Cathedral, and Birmingham Town Hall, just to make sure that it outbigged them all. St. George's was just the beginning of a century of building, giving Liverpool the cultural facelift that Roscoe had advocated. The Liverpool Library and Museum were built, and the Picton Reading Rooms established. And Roscoe's own art collection became the basis of the wonderful Walker Art Gallery. The Victorian rebuilding of Liverpool grasped how important culture is to making a city great. The legacy of all this meant that the Liverpool of my childhood was a place of wonder. I was able to wander through these galleries, looking at some of the finest and some of the worst painting and sculpture in the world. At the height of its 19th century heyday, Liverpool easily rivaled London. It saw itself as the second city of the empire, with buildings to match this elevated status. And it reached its pinnacle with the buildings of the Pier Head, known as the Three Graces. They sit proudly in a row, creating Liverpool's iconic skyline. And so crazy were the rich scousers to build stuff that made them look really good, that now a dark and rainy northern city ended up having the world's first school of tropical medicine. It's still going strong and attracts students from all around the world, not to mention exotic diseases, parasites, and snakes. <laughs> Here we go. This is one of the biggest ones we have in the department. And what is it? This is its official title is Tinea saginata, mm. uh, otherwise known as the beef tapeworm. These are ascaris. They're a, a type of round worm. Humans can get them. Horses can get them. Now this one. This is a cyst. Okay, this is a cyst. It's called a hydatid cyst. This one was taken from a lung of a man in Libya uh, called Echinococcus. Some of these specimens look like they might have been here since the school's foundation in 1898. The School of Tropical Medicine was founded at a time when Liverpool had reached its zenith in wealth and influence. It had built itself up from an uncouth trader to a grand, rather pompous gentleman. And in some ways, I think that maybe Liverpool got carried away by its own self-aggrandizement. I know they're really famous and impressive and everything, but the buildings of the Pierhead sort of remind me of a lottery winner's house. All three, particularly the Liver building, seem to me to be slightly odd and surreal as if Liverpool, having done really big, now wanted to do really, really weird. I mean, what's with the giant mutant chicken bed perched on top? But I can't deny that they are 
monumental and awe-inspiring. And if time could have stood still in Liverpool around the building of the pier head, it would have been great. But unfortunately for Liverpool, the 20th century happened. The city got blasted by bombing during the Blitz. As an entry point for vital American troops and goods, Liverpool was a prime target for German bombs. Six and a half thousand homes were destroyed and 125,000 properties were seriously damaged during the Blitz. But still, amazingly, a lot of the landmarks survived and I can remember them from my childhood. I was a young child in the late 50s and thought that I lived in a city that was paradise. Trams took me into a vibrant city centre and there was a splendid Victorian elevated railway from whose elegant wooden carriages you could look right down the funnels of the giant ships that crammed every inch of the docks. Then suddenly, my world was turned upside down. The overhead railway knocked down and the trams dismantled. But it turns out that this was just the start of the next most extreme makeover for Liverpool. Since the war, Liverpool had slowly been in the process of rebuilding itself, and the Blitz had only added to an already huge housing crisis. Many of the homes in central Liverpool were considered substandard. But it wasn't all a response to the war. Those in control of the city believed that here was a chance to make Liverpool a utopian, modernist city. And for the next two decades, they set about making their vision into reality. The object of the Corporation for the Future of the City is clear. It is to provide an even better city. A city in which citizen and visitor alike will find visual pleasure, colour, activity and recreation. But this time, there wasn't a Roscoe with a vision of culture and elegance for Liverpool. This rebuilding was all about social engineering and managing traffic flow. Whole communities were moved to bleak estates on the outskirts of town and new inner city tower blocks. These experiments in new housing were nationwide, but typically, Liverpool took it to the extreme. In 1966, 100,000 people were moved from their homes in the city centre to newly built communities on the outskirts. However misguided and wrong this solution may seem today, it was at least, I suppose, a response to a real housing crisis in the city. But in the city centre, it was pure vandalism. The very heart of the city was ripped apart, with radical new buildings springing up everywhere. Liverpool has always seemed to be an optimistic place, but it's a kind of psychotic optimism, the optimism of a man with a broken leg who insists that he can still run the marathon. Uh, yeah, it's all right, it will heal while I'm running. So when, in the late 50s, some smooth-talking town planner came along and told the city fathers that he could build them a city that was even more modern than Birmingham, the idiots went for it. During this period, many aspects of life were being revolutionised. Sex, politics, even space travel. And you might think that this is the point where I talk about the Beatles. But actually, to me, at the time, I think the thing that most revolutionised Liverpudlians' lives was... Town planning. With blind faith, Liverpool launched itself into becoming the most modern city in the country. Super efficient road systems would dissect the city and pedestrians would stroll along walkways in the sky eating soup in pill form. In this sci fi world, there were even buildings that transformed into spaceships. And one of these took the form of St John's Beacon. And when it opened, it housed the Tower Revolving Restaurant. I remember the Tower being seen as the epitome of sophisticated, futuristic Liverpool. Basically, because it went round and round. As if the most important element of fine dining wasn't good cooking or fresh ingredients, but centrifugal force. 
Although for a lot of people, dinner at the tower was the most sophisticated thing in town, looking at it now makes me sad. Rather than build something that was special, that had some relevance to Liverpool, that was well made, they simply threw up a shoddy, poor, provincial version of London's telecom tower. Of course, I know that the 60s in Liverpool wasn't all about the destruction of the city centre and terrible food. There was that old Merseybeat scene, for example. I just wasn't part of it, and I was just terribly affected by seeing Liverpool's heart and soul being destroyed. If I was made dictator of Liverpool, I would put into action a plan that I have had since childhood. When the Germans left Warsaw at the end of the Second World War, they destroyed it totally. But it was completely rebuilt, as if the catastrophe had never happened. I would do the same for Liverpool. I would knock down the St. John's Tower and the New Market, and I would bring back the old Victorian Market and the beautiful, friendly network of streets that surrounded it. I would bring back the overhead railway, and I would have every town planner and architect who is still alive shot by firing squad in a meticulously restored Williamson Square! No one listened to me, so, like the proverbial prophet, not honoured in his own land, I left. I moved to London in 1971, and I did it just in time. I was never convinced by the modernist reinvention of Liverpool, but in the end, the vision was never even fulfilled. The whole country went into economic decline, and Liverpool was particularly hard hit. For two decades, Liverpool went into freefall, and by the 1990s, it was one of the poorest cities in Europe. 